Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Let's dive into the reds. Now, what I've prepared for us here today is, is a bit of a, a vintage perspective. Okay. So, I, I think it's I think it's good for us to sort of look back in time a little bit, see what age has done to our wines, and then go back and look at the current vintage. And uh, and this is something I think we we, all, we try to always do in our tastings is, is to let the customer sort of try our past vintages so they can leave their balls unopened at home sometimes. Right. <laughs> so we're going to try 2010, which is last year's, uh, and we're going to try it against this year's, which is the 2011. So it goes okay. 2010 and then 2011. Now the blend on the 10 is 97% Cab, 3% Petit Fredo. And so what we've done for the next three reds is to give you three intensities of flavor to play with. And I think you know, sometimes it's, it's not necessarily that one pairing is designed for one wine. We like to let you sort of mix and match. Okay. So think of these next three pairings as sort of light, medium, heavy. The first one is a light, lightest, which is a fig chutney cream cheese compote, sort of piped into a smoked duck breast. Okay. Right, with some, uh, with some chives uh, on top. And then the middle is, a, is an aged piave with a... Uh, uh, very, very, very paper thin shavings of a uh, of, of beef jerky. Okay. Uh, of a local beef jerky. It's a beautiful beef jerky right on top. And just kind of gives you that savory flavor. And then the last one is a uh, is a dark Cabernet reduction truffle. All right. And, uh, and it, you know, big, bold flavors, you know, really uh, it's going to let you sort of see these three cabs with three different, totally different textures. Okay. And I'll add to that all these wines that we're trying, none of them are decanted straight out of a fresh bottle. Right. This is typically what we do in the winery, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's great to see them open up in front of you. And I think people like to see that. Not everyone's going to decant a wine at home. Right. And 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 in all fairness, we've been talking for quite a while. They report for a little bit. So in, in the glass, they 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 probably have. They really already have had a lot of time to develop a little bit more while we were talking. Yeah, which is which I find when when I so when I do these videos and you know I pop and pour right into the bottle, uh, right into the glass, right into the glass. Um, you know I'm making that snap judgment whether I like the wine or not or whatever. And then of course when I'm done recording, um, and let's say it's on a night that I'm going to go and enjoy some of the wine. Um, I now drink the wine a little bit later, and I can tell you most of the time, especially with the red wines, most of the time I pick up stuff I, I never picked up the first time. Right. And so I almost want to put another camera, put the, just just plop the camera in front of me and kind of talk about more about the wine, but um, not that I can't, but at the same time it's like, you know, um, most people, they pop and pour, so that's how I'm evaluating the wine, but when you... We allow the wine to develop, and even on video sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put, put the wine in, taste it, talk for a few minutes, and then I go back and taste it again, and things have, things have already changed. It doesn't right. take long for things to happen, but over time, you, if you take a couple hours to drink a bottle of wine, you don't have to decant it. You can let, you can let the glass be the decanter. You can, once, once, you've, once you've poured a little bit of the wine out there, yeah, the, the, the opening isn't very big in the bottle, but at least you've, you've increased the surface area in the bottle. But the, the glass to me, I mean, I'll take a while just to drink, drink the, a glass of wine, and that glass is allowing it to decant on its own. Right, exactly. All right, so we're gonna
Oh, that's good. And I mean, I've had I've had duck in many different ways. I worked in a Chinese restaurant, so I've had. <laughs> we never really did Peking duck traditional. Like we never even had it. Like the, the whole twenty four hour or whatever process. But right you now, I've had I've had duck from them. I've had duck in France. I've had duck in the United States. You know, yeah. this is good. Yeah, <laughs> it's simple. It's it's just smoked on on cherry wood. Yeah, very very simple. I can get. Yeah, okay. And, uh, and it's not too smoky because you know we, you're getting the deep slice, so it hasn't really permeated through. And then um, it, it's it's it works with the wine in a, in, a, in a kind of a subtle way. And so you know, ten. When when we look at ten, it's interesting when you compare ten to eleven. You know, I, I think, and you're going to hear this a lot probably this next week. Is that these were challenging vintages for Napa Valley. Even before I got here, I kept hearing about um, you know. Do you do you do you have do you do you have 2011 or do you have 2010? And you know, if the answer was 11, you kind of get that look like, oh, you know, it's like, well, that's because that's what the current release is. Sorry, but you know, right, right, right. You know, right. That's what that's, that's what you're gonna get. You right. know? Well, you know, uh, in 2010, you know, and, and you look at the tasting note here, and you see the weather the, the weather image. It was. Both in some ways, one of the coldest vintages in the last decade and the wettest okay. vintages in the last decade. We really didn't have much of a spring. We kind of went from a, an extended winter into a uh, a short summer. Okay. With rains continuing through May, and so this, in some ways, sort of delayed our growing season from being able to start. And pushing bud break out a little bit, so the key was for us, I think, to prune very early that year. Okay. Get the plants stimulated and started, and uh, and rely a, gamble a little bit on our frost protection system to get us through any potential frost issues early on in the year, and then get our season started early. And so, although the season was only 217 days of growing season on the ingredients in this wine. It has still allowed us to ripen the fruit to a level, so you don't get that herbaceous quality in the 2010 that you're seeing a lot of in, in some of the other 2010s. And at the sacrifice, though, of quantity, so there are less of this wine than, than I would say I would, right. I would have liked to have made, but at least it's a wine that we're very proud of, and, uh, and it, it's a wine that I'm proud to say I don't necessarily taste the weather. Right in this vintage, in 2011, even though it was even more challenging of a vintage, we actually got better at it. And so I actually think that in 2011, although it was even colder, uh, even uh, we did we had even shorter of a season because the saving grace of 11 was that the rains were not as pre prevalent in the latter part of the year. We were able to extend that growing season and get 230 days out of it. And that really allowed eleven to, uh, to to develop into a fully matured, fully ripened wine, and uh, and, and as you can see, you know the alcohol at fourteen eight percent, right. um, and and, and uh, I think I think we really I'm very proud of the team for for eleven to 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 be able to produce a wine that is such a departure from what nature I think tried to throw throw at us. And if I'm looking at the on the on 11, were you harvesting into November? Well, some of the large, some of the la, la, the the furthest ingredients for this wine, and and just so you know, on these tasting notes, the the ingredients um, are the, so the the bud break of the first ingredient and the harvest of the last ingredient in the wine are depicted by that green vignette area right, right. on the chart, and uh, yeah, there were some some uh, I, I think it's October 30th. To be accurate, but uh, it was almost into November. Um, but you know, we just didn't have that rain in October, and so we just went right up to that last minute, and watching that forecast like a hawk. Uh, you know, kind of almost gr greedily getting that little bit of ripeness out of those last hanging hanging fruit. You know, I can say that between those two. I actually like the 11 a little better. Um, 
you know, that we get starting into personal preferences and I like this too. Cheese is amazing. In some ways, I kind of agree. Yeah. And only because I think 10 perhaps is, is, is showing better. It's a little bit older. I think it has, a, it's a little, the more, it's a little more expressive than the 11, in the, especially in the aromatics. But I think there's more going on in 11. I think, yeah. I think the wine is more complex. It's more, it has more dimension to it. it and I, and, and, you know, and it's, a seasoned palate like yours can definitely taste through uh, youthfulness in a wine. Mm -hmm. And if we keep beating this 11 up in the glass, right. it gets a little past that, rounds that corner a little bit and becomes a little more expressive. Uh, so right out of the bottle, I think 10 tends to be a crowd favorite, but give 11 a little bit more time. And I think it may change that. It may change your mind a little yeah. bit. Yeah, I mean, I think they're, they're both excellent. So it's not like, it's not like, you know, you have to, if you, if you chose 10, I'm going to, if someone, I'm going to sit there and say, well, you're an idiot. Um, <laughs> but, but it really just, there's, there's something about the 11, I just, in the overall, the overall structure and the quality and, and everything that mm -hmm. I just kind of like a little bit better, but they're both equally good. I mean, if, if, if I had either glass put in front of me, not told what it was, not given any information, right. You know, I would be perfectly happy with it. So, um, well, when, when we circle back to them mm -hmm. here, uh, let's see if you, you still maintain that, right. uh, that, 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 uh, opinion. So this last glass, this is a bit of a toy. Okay. This is a wine that we call Gaston. And, All right. Um, and uh, I, 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 get to, I get to sort of say this is a, 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 named after uh, my son, who we just had. He's 10 months old. Okay. And he's kind of carried on my middle name. So this was a wine. You know, each family member gets a, name, a wine named after them. This is a, kind of an obnoxious trait my parents started a long time ago. <laughs> but uh, but uh, so this is the Gaston. And Gaston is 100% Cabernet. So single vineyard, and and you can kind of think about this wine as, you know, as I told you downstairs, we're here to make this. Right. Everything we do is to make Palmas, the Cabernet Sauvignon that that we have been making forever. Gaston is not made every year, because in some years, when the winemakers sit in front of all those wonderful ingredients and they they're there to craft first Palmas. The some some years there's a little leftover of their favorite single ingredient all by itself. Okay, and it's really nice if you if you can and Palmas doesn't need it to bottle it all on its own. Now of course you're going to make a pathetically small amount of it. Right, <laughs> right, um, and it's going to come from a single part of the vineyard, and it's going to be a very kind of uh, uh, a single expression. But it's what nature did best that year. And uh, this is a 2010. Okay. So we're going back in time a little bit, back to 2010. We did not make a Gaston in 2011. Okay. So it doesn't come out every year. It's a little bit bolder, a little simpler in some, some ways. I like that. So, I want to ask about. So, this is. Did you uh, you saw it a little bit left over? Is that when we were talking earlier about how um, when when your winemakers giving you that recipe of they want twenty seven point eight percent and not point <laughs> seven whatever, and you're getting all the stuff out of the barrels. So this is where where that if you had rounded off, you would have used all the wine. But this is. You know, because there's no rounding error. Well, in, in pulling out from the barrel for the bottling, or so we talked about our second label, right? right. C Cedar Knoll Vineyards, mm -hmm. right? Cedar Knoll Vineyards um, is is it's an incredible wine because it's the entire process. But we need Cedar Knoll Vineyards to exist so that we can make Palmas as refined as it is. Mm -hmm. And so, what doesn't make it into Palmas uh, is is uh, is then sort of re re examined to create a new wine. Uh, from Cedar Knoll, which we call Cedar Knoll Vineyards, which is Hagen's old label, by the way. But of those available ingredients, our favorite ingredient, the one that we sometimes call the anchor point 
of palm oz. And, 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 and I've heard the winemakers kind of use that term. Uh, me and Tina will sometimes describe a, 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 a point where, where they build a wine around. And sometimes that sort of anchor point uh, can be what Gaston is. That we, we just bottle by itself. So it gets its own mm -hmm. you know, label. And, and, and so in essence, it's, it's not as complex. It, it's not as, uh, it, it's a single point of the vineyard's excellence expressed in, you know, and, and, and I think that, that that's always what 100% Cabernet, single vineyard varieties right. have always been uh, because, you know, it's just to show off what, what, what went right that year. <laughs> right. And, uh, and I think it, it's fun to be able to do this. Now, of course, in its nature, we're not going to be able to make a lot. I mean, uh, we're talking about maybe, maybe a, a couple hundred cases at most. And so this is a wine that goes exclusively to the club members. You know, it, it, it's, uh, you know, I mean, all the wines are, are basically fully allocated to the club. 10% mm -hmm. um, get to slip out and go to restaurants and, 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 and some retailers. But, uh, but a very small production overall, you know, uh, under 10,000 cases total for the whole, for the whole production, including Cedar Knoll and Palmas. And so we, it's fun to be able to make a wine like this because right. it, it does show uh, what, what went right in, in one of those wonderful vineyards. But like I said, if Palmas needs it all, mm -hmm. it gets it all. And in 2011, it, <laughs> it got, got it, it all. all. Right. That's real good, and and I like the chocolate with it. Um, you know, I've never been a real big chocolate wine guy, but this pairing with this particular chocolate mm -hmm. is pretty exquisite. You know, I, I, I'll I'll at home just because <clears throat> I'll have chocolate, I'll have red wine, I'll do it, mm -hmm. but it's not always all it's cracked up to be. It's just kind of like, yeah, okay, I did it, and, and it worked, and. And, and I, it was, it was just the pairing that was available. Um, straight up bittersweet bar chocolate and wine. Something like that. Yeah. You know, is, is, uh, yeah, it's not my, not always been my favorite pairing in the world. Right. I'm much more inclined to do a savory, um, you know, cheeses and wine. I mean, how can you beat that? <laughs> mm-hmm. But I do think, I mean, I haven't done all three wines, but I do think the Gaston um, does really well with that. Now just kind of going in between all the wines, just kind of just figuring out, you know, what what I'm what I'm looking at and. Smelling and seeing what this is my what favorite changes. time of the tasting when you get yeah. to go back and sort of just rediscover things you maybe didn't pick up on in the, in the first run through and, and even sometimes hit the whites a little bit. <laughs> sometimes I go back to at least the Chardonnay and, right. and I and I find something. Wow, it's totally different. And I'll do that at dinner too. You know, mm -hmm. you, you know, at, at the at, you know at the end of end of the night at a. Uh, at a nice dinner, and you, you got you got glasses going like a like a choo choo train right. off, the, <laughs> off the corner of your off the corner of your tablecloth, and uh, and uh, and, and you, you reach back over here to that to that delicious maybe Sauvignon Blanc or something you right. started the evening with, and wow, they're like different animals. <laughs> I mean, I've done it like at a restaurant where maybe I started off with a white wine, and I didn't finish it before I got my next course and I got my next wine. Right, and so sometimes I'll leave that wine on the table. And I'll finish my main course, and sometimes the server is kind of like, do you want me to leave it? Yeah, I want you to leave that wine, because I'm going to revisit that. Of course. Or I may have only drank a certain amount of it because I'm going to pair it with dessert, or right. I pair it with something else I want to drink later. So right. I purposely only drink some of it, mm -hmm. so that I have that ability to go back to it. Um, I mean, all three are all three are great. I still, you know, still 11, I think, is still going to be my favorite of the three, but like I said... 
I think we did all these you ones could, a favor when we let them sit. Yeah, while we, we did. Were chatting in the beginning. But but if you put any one of these in front of me, I, I would I would be perfectly happy. So. <laughs> I think our, our our reds have had a bit of a um, uh, of a style to them that they they've never been enormous reds. You know, they've never been huge alcohol bombs. Right. And you know, I, I think this is true a little bit of our our corner of the industry that this kind of you know I hate to. to to profile us as as as, as being the boutique, you know, um, kind of corner of the industry, but we tend to sometimes create wines with overt qualities because many times people tend to associate overt qualities with with quality. Right. You know they. Something that is big, you know. It's just, these are descriptions we hear all the time. This wine is enormous. It has huge oak, huge tannins, big alcohol, and uh, we, we, we sometimes we forget to judge a wine on on a very seldomly heard yummy factor, <laughs> right? You know, and and I think it's my dad does. He 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 he's I either like it or I don't. Um, yeah. he, he, you haven't had the pleasure of him telling you that he doesn't taste all that quote crap and smell all that crap that I smell and taste. Um, but, 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 but yeah, that is the bottom line, whether you like it or not. And just, you know, at least for me, no amount of wine knowledge that I can, you know, accumulate through the years, at the end of the day, I still either can, can put it in two boxes. I like it or I don't like right. it. Right. And, uh, and, and so th there's a, a timeless effect, and I think Napa's been a little guilty of this over the past few years, creating wines that are enormous. They have this, this power to them. But all these things that we tend to impart in the wine's power come from things that, that are manip easily manipulated in the winemaking, like tannins and oak mm -hmm. and alcohol. These are all things that the winemaker can easily kind of turn the dials to manipulate in the wine's character. Right. And we're sort of getting away from the the real essence of the wine's character, which at the end of the day is the fruit it comes from. And if we, we put all these barriers in front of that, and we don't allow the taster to see through to the terroir and where it grew and, and the true essence of the wine's uh, story, uh, I think we're doing the taster a disservice. Right. And so I, I believe that it's important that the wines uh, get to tell that story. And, and, and so in the winemaking, the winemaker is there to sort of help tell the story of the terroir and, and the microclimate and where the fruit grow and, put, and p help package it in a way that's beautiful, that's transitionless between the, you know, the hello and the goodbye of the wine. Right. The onset of the palate, the mid palate, and the finish. And, and I think that the wines, especially from this property, where we have this unbelievable diversity of elevation and, and microclimate and, and all this weather that we can get, you know, unique to this area of Napa, it, it's, it's great that uh, we, we've been able to, to, to I think, com completely tell that story. And if you look back at our wines, 10 years of... Of, uh, of, of historical releases from us, it's great to see that that story's been consistently told. Right. And that we didn't produce wines that were uh, a little bit of the fat. You know, I, I want to be able to, to look back and, 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 and feel that we've been making wines true to the property. And I think, you know, again, that, that yummy factor. Yeah. It has to be there. There has to be a satisfying deliciousness to the wine, regardless of its price point or, 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 or its story or, or who made it or who's behind it. At the end of the day, you know, when it's in that, when it's in that brown paper bag and you don't know what it is, the blind tasting right. is going to tell all. And, and I think, you know, there's, <clears throat> there's lots of boutique and quote cult wines that are out there. And 
And I do think you're right that there's um, that there is this association that the the more cultish or more, more boutique a wine, the bigger and bolder and in your face and just explosive it, it, it has to be. And I think that's more the public deciding that, um, or or at least or at least telling the winemakers that that's what they want, instead of like they want so that they feel that there's a uniqueness or something is extraordinary about it rather than it's it's a well-made wine it's balanced uh, it doesn't it doesn't hit you bold in the face yes it's it's a uh, it's a higher price point um, but it's not going to it's not going to um, destroy you when you're when you're drinking it versus you know or, or, or compete with the food you're yeah you're eating with right exactly yeah, yeah. And, and I think with our customer base um, our customer base tends to be people who, who, who know what they like. You know, I, I don't think they, they don't need to be told this is um, this is quality. They know it when they taste it, mm -hmm. and they fall in love with our with our brand because I think we we've been very true to that to that technique of of producing uh, a, a wonderfully consistent. You know, uh, a wine that that is true of the property. We're not sort of navigating the waters of what's in vogue of right that year, and uh, I think that consistency at the end of the day is what the seasoned taster is going to eventually, hopefully, reward when they when they keep continuously purchase the wines. Right, and uh, and hopefully, hopefully, we we're able to continue that and. and Generations can continue that. That's, that's the goal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's. Uh, we have a final, a final wine. A final here. toy. Yeah. So this is, um, you know, this is a, a. This wine is named after my sister Florencia. Okay. And my, now my sister uh, really is behind. Um, I, I think if there's a family member, uh, uh, you know, because I, I think I, I grew up without the gift for really being able to. To have that wonderful palate, my sister has it. She, she has a wonderful palate. She has an incredible vision for this place, and it's a real, it's 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 a it's a really interesting approach that she had with this wine. When when uh, so this was named after her. It's a Moscato Canelli. It's a dessert wine for people who, at the end of the day, you know, I get to the end of a dinner. And you know the dessert wine rolls around, and the reality is, what I think I selfishly want to do is I want to you know finish dinner, get up off the table, and take with me the best wine on the table, right? It, it, it's it's one of these, right? It's the red, it's the one. It's it's probably the most expensive bottle on the table, first of all, mm -hmm. and it by now it's just opening up to where we. <laughs> We all really want to enjoy that last sip, right. or hopefully there's a little more in the bottle down the table, and we want to go hang out with our friends and, and drink some more. The problem with these big, thick sauternes is that at 30% residual sugar, there's only two things you can do with this wine afterwards. Either drink coffee or go home. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your palate is shot. You, right. You're having a hard time going back to cat. And... You know, so when we think about a dessert wine, I kind of want it to just be, you know, uh, an expression, a fun experience, and that's it. So we envision uh, the dessert wine being kind of uh, restrained back to about five to six percent residual okay. sugar. So, you know, think of uh, the the last sauterne you had. Think half as sweet as that, and think half as sweet as that. You know, so get down to a much lower sugar value where it's just perceptibly sweet. It's got the bright acidity, so we grow the fruit at the warmest part of the property. We don't let it overripe. We've brought in whole cluster press, cold fermented, and uh, we make this very pale color. Muscat is extremely effervescent, has big aromas, right? But is soft on the palate, and it's not. It's not uh, this ex kind of explosive gumdrop. Of a wine let the dessert be sweet the wine doesn't need to be over the top right and I think you can go you can kind of try this wine you pair it with this little apricot biscotti we, we, we did and then you can almost go right back to Cabernet without a without a hitch
really is a nice, a nice little pairing there. See, the wine is kind of light. It, 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 it kind of sits on the palate, but then right. kind of, kind of uh, it has a long finish. Actually, it, you expect it to be sort of bigger to have that kind of a finish, but it, it's, it's subtle. It, it doesn't have a lot of, uh, of lingering effect in terms of sweetness. And, it's, and I think the acidity is, is critical here. It needs to have this bright acidity right. so you can kind of move around to something else afterwards. And I mean, just, <clears throat> I felt like very introspective with it. I mean, it was just because I'm, I'm, I'm looking, I'm like gazing that. intently into this biscotti and, and it's like, and I'm just like, I wouldn't say necessarily analyzing it, but I'm just kind of just allowing I'm not trying to make it sound any, any more than, than the reality here. <laughs> it's all of a sudden sound like this epiphany and the angels saying and all that. But just but allowing... I mean, you're allowed to have an epiphany back to your, what, uh, uh, set, sixth glass yeah. of wine. You can have an epiphany. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, just, just sitting there, just kind of just allowing it to naturally progress with, with the combination. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not that I couldn't have done that with any of the other pairings, but... When I got to this one, it was just kind of like, man, this is just really, it just really just kind of worked on on just this real uh, kind of just singular level. I don't want to use the word simple, but like a just a real, you know, even level. And the other pairings were outstanding, so it's not like I'm trying to like say, oh, no, that's, that pairing sucks. I mean, even the salmon pairing was good. I mean, I don't like but salmon. But it is, it is a simple yeah. pairing. It's a it's a biscotti for Christ's sake. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, right. I mean, it's this is not a, this is not a, a four layered terrine dessert. Uh, yeah, know, and, and I think I think we we, we tend to uh, I, I would say most people don't do dessert wines. You know, I I, I I would say venture to say that most most average you know wine enthusiasts probably in their cellar of all the wines they have. The least number of wines they're going to have is their dessert wines. It would be for me too. It's yeah. true for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just not a wine I'm, I'm out there shopping for. Um, and, and and we tend to not do it. We, we tend to just just bridge right over. We don't tend to pair wines with dessert, or, or we try, where we on top of that we try to design a pairing for the cab, which is hopefully still lingering after right. the main course. I I I want to think that there's a place in this world for dessert wines, and 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 so I. I just don't need it to be thirty percent residual sugar, right? And, and and you know, I think I think that works because, especially, really, really, especially with with any pairing, whether it's a dessert wine, a white, red, the pairing needs to complement, not overpower. So, right. if this was a thirty percent residual sugar with with the biscotti, it's not it's not going to work. Yeah, you're just going to taste wine. Well, and this tasting would be over. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, you, you would you would just taste the wine. That'd be it. Um, it would, you know, like my dad would say, it would taste like medicine because um, <laughs> we had we had a sauterne uh, one time at, at, at last year, and and it was a winery. I had one of the wineries I visited in France, and they had it on the list at this restaurant, and I ordered it. And of course, I'm thinking it's great. I'm thinking it's great because I'm remembering the the experience and all that. Right. And I also knew what I was going to have for dessert. I was going to have just very simple. Ice cream with a salted caramel sauce on top. Yeah. Okay. So the savoriness is what really brought out the the sauterne. Was really what complemented it. Wasn't the ice cream. It wasn't the sweetness. It was the savory. Which when we talk in our San Antonio Sommelier Association meetings, one of our vice president really likes to emphasize savory stuff with a sauterne. Okay. Now you don't need sweet with it. It already is sweet. You you, know? you, you mean like like charcuterie and yeah, and, or yeah, and, and or with or cheeses. You know. Yeah. He's like. Have cheese with dessert wine, not dessert. Yeah, and I was like, and you're absolutely right because you you need to have that that uh, it's more of a con I guess more of a contrast rather than a compliment. Right, complimentary. Right. Um, but um, so he he had the wine and he and he and my my cousin in law that's not even a term but my cousin's wife they were like they were snickering about the wine and oh Mark's Mark ordered this wine that sucks and um, and I said really okay. I said, now try my dessert with this wine. And he was just like, the caramel with this. Yeah, the, yeah. And he was like, ah, I get it now. I'm like, okay, see, the problem was, I, it was all your desserts were unpairable. 
Well, I already had determined I was ordering this wine no matter what. <laughs> so I knew that I was going to like the wine. I'm paying for it anyway. So I'm going to enjoy the wine. I took the rest home, enjoyed it, and, and even the next day it was even better. And he tried it, and he was like, yeah, it was okay. It's a little bit better, but it still tastes like medicine. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it's really just a testament how food and wine really complement each other. Um, Absolutely. You know, and, and, and pairing it correctly. Just because, you know, the whole red wine and chocolate thing, I mean, it, it can work, but it's got to be the right pairing. It can't right. just be red and chocolate, right. you know. So, I mean, this has been an outstanding experience, an outstanding tasting. Um, I, I don't know how this is going to get topped the rest of the week. And no offense to any of the other wineries I'm going to, because I know I'm going to some really great wineries. Um, and... Um, uh, and it's not meant to be a competition that it's, it's gonna it's gonna you know I'm I'm not looking for a winery to outclass the other no um, because at the end of the day I know that in my experience in doing these in doing these things when I go out and do interviews the hospitality that is shown to me by every single winery I've ever had the pleasure to to visit and sit down and do an interview has been overwhelming it's just um, and it's but, just it's an industry thing whether it's France Texas or here it's been it's been the same you know I. I <laughs> this is a small. It's a very small town. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I will tell you. I mean, everything I showed you today, down in the cellar. You know, you know this, and I know this. Not a single bit of it explains why these wines are good. Mm -hmm. They just explain why they're not bad. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what makes a wine great in this world is the fruit it comes from and the people behind it, mm -hmm. and. What's, what's most amazing about Napa Valley is that you can drive from one point to the other and see every winery along the way and not see anything really overlap. You know, the philosophies, the, 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 the concepts behind the winemaking, it's, it's, it's all amazing. And, and I think it's a real privilege to get to just be here, right? To be able to make wine surrounded amongst this greatness that makes this valley and uh, and the wonderful wines that we all get to produce and and uh, it, it's it's great to be in your shoes and, and sort of take it all in because right. believe me you know my wife and I and the family we 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 love just as much to, to go and see how it's done somewhere else right and uh, and it's it's and not, not as a, not not as a not as a we do it better or worse. No, it's, it's, no, no, it's, no. it's a, it's really just to see what else is, you know, just just to experience it and and, and the pleasures of, of what somebody else does differently, right? The camaraderie in the valley yeah. is amazing, you know. And and, and and you know, in recent news with the earthquake and everything that happened with that, right? I think no more was it more apparent when the earthquake hit and 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 those wineries that were affected more than the others, um, the, the the level of help. That came from friends right. was endless, and and I saw, even though I don't live here because I do I, I get the the daily uh, yeah. news stuff. You see it. You see you saw the 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 outpouring of support, whether it's uh, financial or not. Just um, you know, you could see that, and and I kind of already assumed that that there is that camaraderie in the valley. I mean, I mean, not not to. Not, not, not to sit there and think that Bottle Shock is, is the end-all, be-all of, of, <laughs> of movies about Napa Valley, especially since it took place in the 70s. Right. But, but being in Texas and, and talking to the Texas wine winemakers, and there's also a comparison of the Hill Country and Texas wine is, is very much what Napa was in the 70s. Sure. Um, there is a, if one succeeds, everybody succeeds right. type of mentality. And right. um, I see that with Texas um, because... They're, they're, they're all trying to create uh, world-class wines in, in an environment where they don't really have any experience. I mean, and even in Napa, you had, you had the experience early on, and then Prohibition happened. Right. And then we, lo we lost all that time. Lo yeah, you, lo <laughs> you lost like almost, what, almost 50 years, really, of, of wine making. It's hard to get back on your feet as a wine industry after Prohibition. Yeah. <clears throat> and then with, with you know, 
the Mandavis and, and of the world and, and all the people that in the 60s, in late 60s, really starting into the 70s, you know, with, with the Montalenas and all those in, in the Fremark Abbey, which is where I was at earlier today, the them re, rediscovering uh, or re, reigniting the winemaking that happened, you know, like you said, with, 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 uh, um, the wine back then, you know, the 19, you know, the 1800s with, with getting the, um, getting the recognition in Paris. I mean, I think a lot of people forget that Napa in the late 1800s was becoming recognized as a world-class wine making area. And we just kind of assumed that bottle by bottle, it was happening, you know, yeah. because, of, because of guys like, like Henry Hagen and, right. and, and the Christian brothers and, mm -hmm. and all that rich history that the Valley left back then. And then we hit this big hurdle prohibition. Right. And we had to kind of start over after that. Yeah, and then, and then the, the American palate got used to the whole, we'll ship you the grape juice and, <laughs> and the packets of yeast to right. make your own wine at right. home. Right. And of course, it became very much sweet wine or you had the sacramental wine. So our palate became used to that type of wine. Right. And then it just took, it took time to, to really get to the point where we are now, whether it's just Napa Valley wine or anywhere else in the country. Um, is the style of wine that, that we now enjoy. But um, yeah, I mean, just the, uh, you know, the, the people at Fremark earlier today were awesome. You know, Ted, Ted was incredible, giving us a little tour of the place. Mm -hmm. And we talked about his philosophy of wine and I've really enjoyed all that. You know, I've got to sit down with you and then I've got other wineries that we're hitting tomorrow uh, for interviews and then Friday for interviews. Thursday is a, is a, Kind of a day where I get a to do a little day. bit, of, kind of like yesterday was a little bit of a free day. We do nice. have one appointment on Thursday, um, kind of in the late morning, and then. But I've got free reign to do whatever I want and nice. knock on a couple of doors, and I'll probably maybe if it's by appointment only, maybe make a phone call. Hey, can I come by? Um, because I did do that with one winery who was very kind enough to. to I just knocked on door and said, hey. Can I can I can I can I bother you for a little bit? And well, by the way, this is who I work for, and we sell your wine. And right. but they were like, "Yeah, go ahead." <laughs> you know, that was that was kind of a nice nice that they they did that for me, and I was very very happy and very appreciative of it. Um, with the same time, I know that I can't just walk up to some some other like I couldn't come up to here and just like, "Hey, can I just come on in?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's 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 uh, it's a little bit different, you know, with that. But um, I, I totally appreciate the hospitality. Um, we briefly touched upon how to get your wines, uh, mostly through through the winery, uh, through the club. Um, you are you are at some restaurants, and are is there any retail presence, or is it really well in, in Texas? Limited? In Texas, for example, Specs. Okay, you know Specs, like in downtown Houston, will get a very small selection every okay. year, and uh, and they have their own kind of distribution models. It, unfortunately, at this case production, it's hard to it. it, it well, it's a little easy to spread yourself thin across all the states. Right, you know? yeah. And so uh, the most reliable way to get the wines, you know, in, in, in a reliable format is, is to join the Barossa Society, um, which we have, you know, uh, got openings of availability throughout the year. Okay. Um, and uh, but it's, you know, we, we like to, to, to think we're very approachable. You know, um, visitation in the winery, you know, although it's by appointment, you know, we're, we're one of those places where you call and we pick up the phone. Right, yes. <laughs> you, 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 you ask for an appointment and we'll do our very best to, to, to work around your, your, right. your schedule when you're in Napa. Right. Uh, you know, the, the, the tastings, private, never mix with other groups. Right. Um, you know, we, we want this first and foremost to be a wonderful experience. This is, um, you know, we, we, we want to, to create enlightenment in, in, in the customer's eyes and, and that and we realize you know there are an amazing amount of wineries in Napa Valley and and no one's here just to visit one of them right and so we we we, we want to hopefully create that experience that leaves people happy enchanted with this sense of of, uh, of wonderment about the wines and a little bit of education, you know, right. so they learn a little bit about how wines are made here, and then all, you know, all of our staff, including us, the family, we try to give as many tours as we can. Uh, everyone here is 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 very very educated, all at the pinnacle of their careers, and uh, we we love nothing more than to have visitors. Cool. 
Well, um, I think it's a good time to wrap it up. We went pretty long, a little longer than I normally do. I hope everyone's still watching. Um, uh, but uh, um, this is not does not tie the record of Fall Creek. Uh, Ed and Susan Aller um, was amazing. Uh, and it was like a three hour interview. Um, <laughs> it, it really pretty much was three hours. Um, and then we had lunch after that, which was even more incredible that uh, they, they extended that hospitality even farther just to like have lunch with me. And I'm like, and I was still pretty small at the time with all this. But um, uh, I do want to thank you. I want to thank your family and everybody here to uh, open up the doors and allow me to come in and spend a lot of your time uh, uh, to go through the wines and go through the facility. Um, I want to thank everybody else uh, out there watching. So um, as always, uh, thank you all for stopping by. Um, I'll have a link below for the winery so you can check it out. You can go to the website, check out the, check it out. Or you can Google it and figure it out yourself. You don't have to go to the website to figure it out. <laughs> but um, especially, you know, all my TiVo watchers, that's where most of the people watch it. Um, you can click the links above to friend me up. There's a button over there to you can send a send a couple ducats uh, to pay for enough pay pay for me to get home. Oh, I'll already be home. Never mind. Um, and uh, <laughs> to pay for the next trip out here. That's what the it next is. Trip is. The right. next trip. The um, next trip. And um, that's that's going to be it. Um, again, thank you all. Thank you. Thank everybody out here for watching. And we will see everyone again next time. <laughs>